Hello, friends. Welcome to the Nexus Podcast. I'm your host, James Dice. Each week, I fire questions at the leaders of the smart buildings industry to try to figure out where we're headed and how we can get there faster without all the marketing fluff. I'm pushing my learning to the limit, and I'm so glad to have you here following along. This episode is a conversation with Corey Clark, Senior Director of Product Marketing at VUE Inc. VUE is known as a smart window company, but with their acquisition of Iodium and RxR Realty's WorksWell product last year, they're expanding into a more comprehensive full stack of offerings. We talked about Corey's work at RxR Realty pre-acquisition, which was super interesting to hear about technology development from the landlord's perspective. Definitely stay in tune till the end where we unpacked how landlords might begin to measure occupant experience. In between that, we dove into the VUE's product strategy and how and why they're expanding beyond Windows. Corey talks about how their stack is made up of open and composable parts, so we break down what that means. Without further ado, please enjoy the Nexus Podcast with Corey Clark. Hello, Corey. Welcome to the Nexus Podcast. Thanks for coming on. Uh, can you start by introducing yourself, please? Uh, sure. Thanks for having me. I'm Corey Clark. I am a Senior Director of Product Management at VUE, Inc. All right. We're going to unpack what VUE does. Um, I'd love to hear about your background first, though. So typically do a deeper dive on people's backgrounds so people know where you're coming from, what your expertise is, how you got here. So can you talk about yeah your, your background? Sure. Had a, had a pretty wandering path here. Uh, so started in architecture, undergraduate, graduate school, architecture, seven years of school, loved it. I love buildings. I love the idea of like designing experiences. It is a very noble profession, but if you haven't actually been in architecture, it's pretty poor paying. <laughs> It's not the, not the best pay scale. And, you know, there's a lot of challenges there. I think we can unpack it later, but they, one of the things is they, it's actually really hard to measure the success of your work and, and the effectiveness of it. But fortunately, when I was graduating, it was early in kind of the dot-com era. I also kind of had a side hustle of doing like web development and was kind of fascinated by digital experience as well. It kind of scratched a lot of the same itches. It was a lot of the same challenges and approaches, but slightly faster turnaround instead of three or four years between design and getting right. somebody to experience your product. It's a couple of weeks. Right. So uh, ended up going to work for a startup instead doing like early online gaming and 3D gaming and online communities. Also had the experience of kind of building a startup and going through the dot-com bubble burst, so shutting it down, so which was an interesting experience. And basically from there, kind of ping pong between digital and physical experience stuff. So actually did do some architecture work, taught at Columbia University for a while as a, as a professor of architecture, did a lot of R&D there, mostly around digital fabrication, helped set up their fabrication lab doing like large-scale 3D printing, CNC manufacturing, water jet cutting, I worked for the prefab industry for a while, developing software to automate designs for flat packing, but then also did pure digital work, ended up doing a lot of digital marketing, digital product development. So built the e-commerce sites for Mac Cosmetics and Estee Lauder, a lot of apps for like Nike and Converse. Oh, wow. All their Fastoria. So a lot of consumer-based stuff, even like a data science platform for McDonald's. And a lot of B2B, everything from like the first Watson Health app to did the, the knock for, for Alchemy all their data visualizations of their kind of content delivery network. So yeah, a lot of just pure digital products and eventually tried to find a way to like do it together. Like that was the dream where I could kind of also yep. do a little bit of physical and, and really impact space, but do digital as well. And so the, the first thing I found that kind of seemed like it could do that was that I went to work for WeWork in their enterprise technology team. So basically it was product lead on enterprise technology, which to them was trying to take all the, kind of IP that they built in the co-working space and figure out how to package and, and sell it to third parties. So not co-working use cases. So, and, and that was bundled with design services and, and operating services. So basically if you went into a WeWork and you're like, oh, this is great. I wish my office was like this. Totally. That's what the, the enterprise team would do. So we did the Expedia offices, we did part of Sprint's headquarters, it worked for Walmart and I, I owned the tech side. So it was everything from the taking their occupancy solutions and figuring out how to use those in, in 
normal workplaces as opposed to just measuring for co-working use cases. The, the WeWork app, you know, that had booking and community and communications and figure out how to use that as a workplace experience app, their desk booking solution. So all of that tech and kind of adjusting the roadmap to, to meet those more enterprise use cases. And then, you know, was there for a couple of years and you covered this enough in your <laughs> podcast as to what happened with WeWork or you can watch the movie, the various movies, but yeah, left there and then went to RxR and kind of stand up their technology product team for commercial buildings. It kind of brings me to yeah, where we are now. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I haven't started the, um, there's a new show on Apple plus. I haven't started that yet. I know um, I, haven't, I haven't either. I think it's, I, I did watch the one on Hulu and it was pretty close, but didn't quite cover everything. So I feel like I want to watch the Apple one because I think a little, a little further into the. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I have to ask you like, what, what was your experience like with the whole, with the downfall? I mean, the downfall part was painful because they built such a great team and they had invested so much on the tech side I and mean, they, it was a little crazy, but I mean, they were trying to build everything themselves. They wanted to do a digital twin. I remember talking with Microsoft for a while early on about their digital twin technologies and it works like, nah, we got to build the whole thing ourselves. But like they, but they hired an amazing team to do it. Like the, you know, engineering lead from that had been the engineering lead on Google authentication and it built their whole auth system. Like they had just really great talent, but yeah, right. Once the kind of tables turned there that everybody left and it was, it was kind of yeah. sad to see all those people spread to the wind. It, that said, it's been amazing because like everywhere I go, particularly in prop tech, there's like, there's somebody there that I know because it was such a kind of meeting of people that were interested in mm -hmm. technology, real estate, workplace. And now they've just spread out everywhere. They're either at startups or they're at some of the bigger real estate companies or some of the bigger prop, prop tech companies. So, Got it. Got it. You also mentioned prefab. So when I was first starting my career, I was at a mechanical contractor and I remember when the first, um, the first like chilled water plant on a flatbed truck happened, they like rolled it out of the shop plant. I remember thinking it was the coolest thing. And they started pumping out restrooms cause they did plumbing too, restrooms yeah. and just everything yeah. in a box. And I remember thinking that was the coolest thing. I, I haven't kept up with where that whole world is at recently but it, it, man that's cool yeah i know i haven't either like we're doing mostly uh sip panels if you know where sip panels they're like it's it's almost like structural cardboard it it's two sheets of structural ply held together with foam so it's an insulated structural panel uh, uh -huh. yeah. Structural panel. yeah and so you can build one two-story construction just with like these sheets and nailing them together. And then you yeah, the factory that we were working in was just a giant three axis mill that would just route out the, the slots for all the electrical It would cut all the holes for all the windows. And then, yeah, I spent a lot of time figuring out how to pack all that into a single shipping container and how to best optimize the design of a modular home and slice it up into the right pieces that you had the fewest number of pieces and all packed into a shipping container. It's a weird problem. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> all right, back to smart building. So you mentioned you got to RxR Realty. Can you talk about like the work you guys did there? Yeah. So I came on basically like employee one or two within the, the RxR digital lab, which the, I feel like the digital lab is, is a bit of a misnomer because it sounds like an innovation lab. And while it served that function, the thing that made it appealing to me and, and and what drew me in and I think made it different was that it's it wasn't really an innovation team. It was a product team and and the goal was basically to to help RXR and, and modern modernize their buildings and digitally transform their business. But it was structured differently. It had its own PL and the goal was to be revenue generating. Okay. So we had a target of basically being revenue positive within two years and, and we did meet that. Um, generated revenue by building products that we could sell to RxR, but right. also sell to tenants. So it would be an additional revenue stream by selling products to tenants. And then the goal was to expand that and start selling to either other landlords or third-party occupiers. The, the premise was that 
you know, landlords can't just be providing four walls and, and walking away anymore. They really need to be focusing on services and, and providing optimal experience. And then, of course, there's the, the typical smart building things as well. It's engaged to improve the building operations, performance, sustainability. So we, you know, had one component that was really building this data platform for that. But we're also looking at how to use, basically provide data as an amenity to tenants. The idea that we could provide them data that was either kind of free, you know, that was off gassing from the building, like providing them insights off of the access control data that we already had to help them understand their hybrid work model use cases. How many people are coming in every day? What are the highest days they're coming in? Are they actually coming in at the right times? Is like half your company coming in Monday, Tuesday, and half your company coming in Thursday, Friday, and never intersecting. So really provide insights to the tenants that could be valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also be able to provide kind of uh, upsell packages. You know, if they wanted to do space occupancy, there's additional hardware, you know, we can sell that to them. We can, they can pay us a SaaS fee to turn on those features within the, the platform. So really have the, the data piece be both an amenity, but a additional product and, and service that, that RxR could provide. Um, and, and how so, successful was that upsell to the tenant piece? That's really interesting. We got some good traction towards the end. I think the, the real monkey wrench was with, everything through the last couple of years was COVID. So I started in January, 2019. And so that was the initial goal was to hire a team, build out these products. You know, that was January, March, everything went sideways and ended up, interestingly, it, it ended up accelerating a lot of our work, but under the, the kind of drivers of, of COVID, right? So yeah. we still ended up building a data platform initially, but it was being driven by COVID specific features, air quality. We had wanted to do that anyways, but you know, we weren't doing it just for kind of improving HVAC and then overall wellness. It was like, is the building safe? You yeah. Know, started, we did occupancy tracking because we wanted to know how many people are in the building because it's too crowded. Was it safe? We also did some more like one-off kind of things or seemingly one-off. So we were using computer vision on our CCTV cameras to do mask compliance and, and social distancing compliance in the lobby. But all of those features, we kind of allowed us to build out the infrastructure really quickly. And we've been able to kind of pivot post COVID. So obviously occupancy still super valuable. Now using that, feeding that into other systems, our real-time energy management, things like that. IAQ, obviously still valuable. The CV thing we've shifted the use case and now or it's all the same kind of stack but just a different cv model and we're doing visitor wait times elevator wait times so we can get more experience metrics but it took a while to kind of <laughs> make that pivot and it's like people are just now really coming back to the point that they're gonna start using these tools so we got a lot of interest and in, initial interest in kind of contracts but not a lot of usage because it's still Kind yeah. Of, what do you mean by CV model? Uh, oh, sorry. Computer vision model. So it was. Oh, basically. sorry. Yeah. You said that. Uh, yeah. It was like I remember being, <laughs> I remember it was like September, 2020. I remember just being super impressed by how quickly you guys rolled out all of these use cases for COVID that you're talking about. Is it, is that because of what you just said is like, it was basically an imperative from a landlord standpoint that you get figure these things out or how did you guys move so quickly? Uh, I think it was a couple things. Like one was, it was, yeah, I, Scott, I mean, the CEO really felt it was an imperative. We had to do this in order to get buildings open and, and to make people feel comfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. We also were really lucky because we just started this big push to build stuff and it yeah. kind of laid a lot of the, the groundwork in terms of like building out an IoT platform and data platforming. We were just starting to get kind of the the use cases on top of it, we had to pivot the use cases, but because we had already started the work, we have been installing some sensors and honestly, COVID made it easier. It's like, oh, this is great. The buildings are empty. Nobody's we, here, we, yeah. <laughs> like, we got nothing else to do. So we installed a ton of occupancy sensors, air quality sensors. We didn't have to disturb anyone, just do it. So it, it did allow us to go faster on some of those things. But yeah, there was a huge imperative and, and a lot of the company rallied around it. The, even like to the building engineers, the property managers, everyone that normally is distracted, making sure the buildings are running smoothly, could kind of throw in on helping anywhere they could with this stuff. Got it. 
Okay. And then sometime in the last year, VIEW bought RXR Realty Digital stuff. So can you talk about how that, that happened? Uh, sure. Yeah. And actually wanted to correct one point from your conversation with Joe, because I, I did listen to that one about the you works well thing and please do um because it sounded like in that joe was mostly focusing on the tenant experience app piece and i think that there was a lot of press early on about works well or it was rx well for a while because that was the kind of covid solution and it because that's the thing that you show in like demos and videos like it comes across as a tenant experience app but oddly enough that was kind of the one thing we didn't really build interesting we, you know we kind of purposely didn't build a tenant experience app because it's like, honestly, they're kind of a commodity at this point and it's a channel that it doesn't, you need it. You need a channel to distribute content, messaging, data, but we wanted to focus on the functionality and, and the, the data side. So we built a bunch of features that will work with any tenant experience app. Interesting. Uh, so we okay. had a we needed data on whether basically we needed a building access questionnaire and we needed data on for every building that everybody fill out this questionnaire, did they fail or pass? So like we built that, but that was a feature that plugged into an off the shelf app. We had this thing called the building wellness pulse that was basically provided anybody in our building data about how full it is, how crowded the lobby is right now, whether the air quality is good. Again, that's a feature we just embed into the app and see so RxR has even changed app providers once since then. So we have a lot of tenant facing functionality, but it wasn't a, a tenant app. How does that work from a technical standpoint when they <laughs> switch out apps or you are agnostic to the app? How does that work? So the, it's got, so we have an API layer. Um, so we can always, the tenant app provider could build something custom on top of it. What we, the, the quickest path and the other way we built it is essentially standalone like web applets. So there's single page web applications that there's a bit of a handshake with the URL to make sure that it's James Dice is actually viewing this or Corey's viewing this. It's essentially kind of a single sign on behind the scenes. So as long as the app provider has some form of single sign on token based authentication, they can open up a web view, load our app. We can easily skin it to look like that and it feels seamless, but it's kind of a drop-in. So yeah, it's, it's basically a link with a little bit of junk in the URL, <laughs> but it makes it pretty easy to, to deploy and, and to, to switch, switch between app providers and also deploy it in multiple contexts. Cause I think the thing that bothers me about, I don't know, tenant engagement apps right now is like, it, uh, it reminds me of like, like retail in the, the early aughts or something when, when the app boom happened and like every retailer decided they wanted their own app, you know, and they, yeah. they went and they built their own app because they needed to own the channel. And then they even, I remember there was a couple companies that were blocking other apps in the store. Like you couldn't, if you're inside of a target store, you couldn't open the Amazon app because they block it with their Wi-Fi. Like there was just <laughs> dumb stuff that they were doing because everyone wanted to own the channel. And it like, since then, all the retailers have realized like omni channels, the way they go, it's like, you don't, you need to reach your customer through email, through the store, through mobile app, through other distributors, whether it's Amazon or whatever. And I, I think uh, like real estate is still in that early phase where like, I got to own the, the channel uh -huh. um, as opposed to just bringing the content to where the user is. So I think the approach we took is the idea that we want to be able to get that functionality to wherever they are, we can push it to them in teams or email or or whatever and over time. But right now, yeah, we're pushing it out through the tenant engagement apps. I see. Yeah. Just curious, this is off scripting, but like what, where do you think the whole tenant app space is going? Because I see it from just like a neutral third party. A lot of what we cover on Nexus, we, we've covered tenant apps, but not in detail like we have other technologies. And yeah. What I see from the outside is like, number one, I hear about a new tenant app company every day, it seems like. And then number two, yes, there are all these landlords that are building their own thing. And, but they're not like hyped up tech startups where you're hearing about them all the time. It's just kind of like happening. Yeah. Where do you see yeah. that space going long-term? I feel like it's going to consolidate on a couple. And I actually feel like they're going to be effectively free or add-ons like i know there's a 
a few out there that are like, as they get more and more like transactional functionality in them, I think they can basically pay for themselves off the like, just clipping the, the credit card transaction. But if they actually act as payment processors, so they're getting a cut of that 3% that normally goes to the credit card that, I, yeah, I kind of see them just becoming free. Like I don't see real estate companies paying for them or their BTS, it was smart of them to, they take rise, they take lane, they, it's valuable to them as a data source. I, I could see over time, it's just kind of a free thing on top of ETS. Cause that's, what's really generating the, the money and, and they're really getting value out of the insights that they can glean from, from the app. But, mm-hmm. and I think the landlord will pay for you know, the leasing insights. Right. Uh, pay for that little for the app uh, itself. Yeah, I don't know. I, I could see it going that way or I also kind of baffled that there's not a, any real open source in the prop tech world. And, you know, it's like, yeah, everybody needs a website. I can go, if I'm a huge company, I will go pay for like one of the big platforms. But last I'd heard it was like 30% of the internet's like websites are on WordPress because it's free. It's open source. And yeah. Like there's no WordPress for like tenant experience. They, there just should be. And then I think a lot of landlords would probably pick that. And then if you really can want a lot of value, a lot of functionality, then you, you go buy something. But mm-hmm. I, I, I'm kind of surprised that, I don't know if it's still the kind of, everybody thinks they can make a lot of money because like prop tech's like the, the, the last like, yeah, unclaimed territory or, and it's such a huge TAM and you're like, oh, shit, it's like billions and billions and billions of dollars. Like I, if I just get a little bit of that, I can make a lot of money. So no one's open sourcing, but if, if someone or a couple of real estate companies just put their heads together and said, screw it, let's build this thing and open source it, kind of clobber the market. Totally. I appreciate you pontificating there. That's that's fun to hear a smart person just think out loud. Okay, so Joe and I had it wrong about the tenant app piece. Can you talk about what you guys then had that view purchased and how that how that went down? Yeah, it's challenging because everyone looks at them and sees them as a class company, but I think it's similar to like looking at Tesla and seeing it as a car company. Okay. Like their goal is to, to is to transform the built environment, but uh, only way to do that in I think right now in real estate is to build a vertically integrated solution in the same way that Tesla is like, okay, we want to, you know, basically transform, uh, not even just mobility, but we want to you know, transform the way that people use energy. And, but to do that, we need the full solution. We need a car, we need chargers, we need batteries. Like it needs to be fully integrated. You can't just build an electric car. People can't charge it. You can't just build batteries. There's no cars for them. Edison did the same thing. Amazon kind of had to build a fully integrated stack to kind of really mm-hmm. transform retail. And so Vue, I mean, they started with glass, but it is kind of the, their point of entry into smart buildings. It checks a lot of the boxes that people want with a smart building in terms of improved experience, sustainability, reduced energy consumption, better kind of productivity within the work environment. But to get that to work, it's a piece of glass, you run current through it. So the, the mullion around it needs power and network. So then effectively covered the building in a mesh network. And so they had to develop a full kind of network management solution or a full building network. And then all of those windows are IOT devices. So they built a, a full data platform with visualization aspects. So that basically a digital twin, it could take real-time data from the building. It takes contextual data where the sun is at any point in time, but the shadows from the buildings around, you have the controls in it. I can turn my windows on or off. So they have that full stack of basically the data platform, visualization, network, mm-hmm. and IOT. And yeah, the, the glass kind of let them build that. And now they're looking to kind of expand that across other use cases. So the acquisition that works well was to really provide an insights layer on top of that. So they have the digital twin, it's right now it's collecting all this IOT data. They want to find other ways to visualize it and understand it. And they liked the, the team and a lot of what we built because it was purpose built insights for real estate. And it's part of the reason I'm still sitting in the RXR office, even though I work for you is because I, Basically, we're embedded in a customer. Uh, I can go talk to a prop- property manager. I can go talk to a building engineer. Like I can get 
like really test the stuff that we're doing in context. Mm -hmm. uh, so they wanted that insights piece. And then they also made the acquisition of Iodium, which is basically brings security to that building network. But also I was excited coming into view about Iodium because it's the, um, it's basically the solves the data connectivity problem in buildings. So it's a, you don't know I Iodium, it's a security appliance put it in the basement of your building, you plug in your OT network, your IT network, it secures the whole thing with like zero trust security, makes sure that all of your IoT devices are safely protected, but it also has edge compute and can do uh, software defined WAN. So what that means is you can easily with that device with one click, like open up a secure tunnel to your cloud and get data from your BMS out or any of your sensors directly out. And you can run applications at the edge. So it supports SkySpark, work with Niagara, supports Mapped, ThingWorks, and run any application on that device. And again, extract data out. So between WorksWell and Iodium, they basically have the kind of data pipeline and, and the insights layer. And then they already had that chunk in the middle, which was like the, and I don't want to say digital twin, but let's say data platform with 3D visualization and, and, and all okay. of that. And then the last piece that they've been developing separately was actually sensors. So you kind of can get, if you don't have data sources and you want occupancy or air quality, they've okay. developed uh, kind of their own sensors in-house for, for that piece that either can be embedded directly into window mullions or standalone. And, and all this stuff, the big caveat is like they built a fully vertically integrated stack, but it's a composable stack and it's an open stack because it's, I think the problems I've seen, uh, you've touched on it, some of your other podcasts, is just like how like monolithic some of these systems are and how close they are. And like a lot of the BMS <laughs> vendors, it's like, yeah, it works if you buy everything right. from them and you, know, you can't integrate. So it is a composable stack. If you already have a data platform, we can just put the insights layer on top of it. If you need to get data out of your building, we can install Iodium. You can use your own insights, don't care, but like you can mix and match these pieces. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, if you have the glass and everything else, we love it, you know, you can buy it all, but I don't think like, I don't know, the industry's in this kind of weird spot where there's like a million point solutions that aren't integrated. So then landlords end up becoming system integrators or there's the consolidation that's happening where you're like kind of the Yardi stack or the BTS stack. I don't know. There's these like yeah. happening, but then they're, they're kind of closed and you're not mm -hmm. able to mix and match as easily. I think it's got to get to the point that everyone's approaching this as a more open yeah. platform. And yeah, you would hopefully buy the view sensors because they're better than everybody else's. But if you have your own for different use cases, you need it. And also, even view, they're only going to make occupancy and air quality. You need water leak detection, something else. Yeah, you're you're going to have to buy mm -hmm. them, but our system's going to need to integrate them because you don't want a separate water leak system from air quality, occupancy, energy submetering. Hey guys, just another quick note from our sponsor, Nexus Labs, and then we'll get back to the show. This episode is brought to you by Nexus Foundations, our introductory course on the smart buildings industry. If you're new to the industry, this course is for you. If you're an industry vet but want to understand how technology is changing things, this course is also for you. The alumni are raving about the content, which they say pulls it all together, and they also loved getting to meet the other students on the weekly Zoom calls and in the private chat room. You can find out more about the course at courses.nexuslabs.online. All right, back to the interview. Yeah. So that kind of answers the question that I had when Joe and I were talking and, and we'll link to that episode in the show notes for people that didn't listen to that. For those of you that didn't listen to Joe and I ramble on about stuff we didn't quite know uh, about, which is in this case, why this acquisition happened. But um, it, it sounds like the answer to my wondering, and I'll just repeat what I said there, which was something like, why does a window company feel like they need to then swallow up the rest of the stack? And it sounds like what you're saying is, and if we go back to Tesla, I like that analogy. Tesla couldn't sell an electric car because couldn't sell just an electric car because then their customers would need places to plug them in. 
So they'll therefore build out the charging network. So it's full stack in order to basically solve your customer's problem without having to rely on others that aren't there yet. Can, can you sort of restate why the, why the full stack? Yeah. You know, if you look at other solutions, like for example, there's a ton of insights platforms out there, but yeah. they don't really solve your problem. They just create other problems because you're like, great, I have an insights platform. How do I get data from my BMS up there? <laughs> oh crap, now I got to buy this other thing. And every landmark becomes a system integrator. Unless you can provide something that's end to end that goes from the building all the way up to the cloud, covers data pipeline, data platform, insights, hardware and software, it's, it's hard to get adoption. And so I think you need that and, you know, to set the example, but before it can't be monolithic otherwise. You know, mm -hmm. I work in kind of the brownfield environments that every building is. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, so you're basically like creating a, you know, sort of abstracted architecture here for smart buildings, right? So you have yeah. device layer, you have integration layer, I would call it data platform layer where you have some sort of data model, and then you have applications that do stuff and, and create insights and that kind of thing. That's kind of how I think about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think how do you, or, or real quick to the last part of that question was like, how do you think about the network layer as well? Can you, can you talk yeah, about that? Yeah, I was going to say that was the missing layer in there is, is the network piece. So in terms of what Vue has, and the, it is kind of I mean, it's two, two environments. There's One is the completely greenfield, right? It's like you're building as a hole in the ground. Then it's great. That's easy. You can build your own building network in the way that you want to do it. Vue does actually have a solution for that because they... I said they have to run essentially network to every single window. Mm. It's a ton of network and fiber. That all comes back to uh, a, a device in the basement that can manage that network, also provide all the VLAN so you can have IT and OT networks and split everything out. That device in, in the basement that's tied to the you know, hundreds or thousands of windows is actually running the IODM operating system. Um, hmm. So it is a network management kind of OS, it's just really built for managing buildings. So IODM was an early partner of, of, of Vue before they were acquired. So that's, there is the kind of greenfield version. And then the brownfield is, yeah, most buildings in, in New York, there's who knows how many networks in the building. You may not even manage them as a landlord because you've outsourced your BMS network to, the, to Schneider or the BMS vendor. It's also like the, the rogue kind of shadow networks that happen because you had a company come in to install your occupancy sensors. They didn't want to deal with anything. So they just threw a couple of like SIM cards in there and those yeah. connected straight to the internet, which kind of scary. Like it's just yet another vulnerability. So that, yeah, I think there's a lot of challenges to unpack there because you want to first like converge your network so that you can get your OT stuff connected to the internet. That opens up a whole ton of vulnerabilities. So then you want to be able to lock that down and, and then be able to like get those tunnels to the cloud. And, and, you know, I think I, it seems like where this is going is that like BMSs and everything are eventually just going to be in the cloud. There'll have to be some kind of store and forward thing on site so that internet goes out, like the building doesn't shut off, but I, we've seen even with some of our customers, like they're just, once they have like a secure, solid, redundant pipe between the building and the cloud, they're just going off and picking systems. They're taking their video recorders. They used to be running on-prem. It's some old Dell box from like 15 years ago. Throw that thing out, stream the data to the cloud, do it up there, and then they have central view. Access control, just virtualize the access control system, put it in the cloud pushes it back down to the panels. And like, I just see mm -hmm. every system slowly moving up there and the, you get the fog compute. There was the, I just remember like the internet, like early days, it's like I had like a server and a co-location center. It was like, everybody had like on-prem stuff and then yeah. everything went to the cloud. And now everything's kind of moving to the middle where you end up with like edge compute and fog compute where it's like a little mm -hmm. bit cloud, a little bit on-prem and I, 
I kind of see the building network being that way as well, which is like it's kind of somewhere between the cloud and the edge. Interesting. Can you talk? Can you just define fog? <laughs> can you define fog for, real quick for people? I feel like people understand what we mean by edge. People yeah, understand what I mean yeah. by cloud. Fog doesn't come up as much. I'd love to hear what, what your definition is. Yeah, I, I've heard fog compute defined as basically like cloud at the edge. So it's the like edge compute, cloud managed, or like functions that exist in both cloud and mm -hmm. edge. It's like the kind of... Uh, yeah. So like access yeah. control, I'm going to log into my cloud-based user interface to register a new employee. And then that pushes the new employee's credentials down to the devices yeah. at the fog. Is that how you would say it? Well, I guess, I guess you push it to the edge, but that whole system of like cloud and edge, like ah, I guess got it. heard referred to as fog compute like uh -huh. or like distributed cloud, like that is the other way I've heard it where it's like every single edge device is talking to each other. So it's like a cloud of edges, but I think mm -hmm. I think in building systems, it's going to be cloud, a little more centralized and pushed down to the edge, but uh, got it. I may be using it incorrectly too. I've just heard it in reference to kind of that like fuzziness of between cloud and edge. Yeah. We're, we're all figuring it out together. I can't guarantee that someone won't reach out to one of us and be like, actually, the definition is this, but yeah, you can pass that along. If someone else has a better definition, <laughs> there you go. I will. All right. So that platform layer, right? Someone that the data plot, you called it a data platform. I think you called it the digital twin and then you backed off from that <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Can you talk about like, some people call it an operating system, right? Sometimes. Yeah. So maybe yeah. we should get into yeah. definitions here as well. W yeah. What do you mean yeah. by that sort of, what does that data layer do? Yeah. I, I would, in the way that I define digital twin, I would call the data layer digital twin. But to me, like digital twin is like something that has spatial data. This room is in this floor, is in this building. You know, so it has mm -hmm. the hierarchy. It has like also system hierarchy data. This VAV goes to this EHU and, and all of that. Metadata around the building itself. This room is belongs to this tenants and is for mm -hmm. the marketing department. And then is able to you know, tie that kind of, those are all different contextual vectors, I guess, to real-time data from yep. sensors. Like, so that all in one spot. And so that you can also get like contextual cross system data. So I can take my occupancy of my floor plus the energy consumption of my floor plus the square footage of my floor and get energy usage intensity, mm -hmm. you know, by person. So like that to me is like, a digital twin is those like you know, the various contexts in the real time spatial data might have a cool 3d model might not <laughs> but i think yeah. the, the problem why i backed off digital twin is then you also get like the, the companies that are doing just like matterport which is like awesome product mm -hmm. but it's a visualization walkthrough yeah but it, it's it's packaged in, in called a digital twin and right well yes if you like does have contextual data and it's sort of got a couple of those legs, I, but it, yeah, that's why <laughs> Yeah, it's such a bastardized term at this point in the industry. Yeah. It and almost like, doesn't mean anything. And even yeah. when, even when people like, like you just were, you were using it to mean the full definition as you just described, but then you kind of backed off it because you're then worried about uh, just it being a bastardized term, which is, yeah, yeah that's unfortunate. So, you mentioned open and composable. I just want to go back to the word composable just uh, real quick yeah. so that yeah. people understand what you mean by that. I, I think I get you, but will you explain that uh, a little bit more? Yeah. I mean, the way I'm using it is, it is a, it's a stack that you can essentially mix and match. It's, it's the a la carte menu or like the, the McDonald's menu. I can order the, the fries. I can order the burger. I can order a drink. I can also just get a, yeah. a number three meal. Like I, Either way, I can mix and match, but it all works together, but it can work independently is, I guess, the, the best way to. Yeah. And you guys are building each component so that it could be procured and installed on its own. Yeah. Like each component has a set of APIs and services that 
are consumed by the next component we've built or can be used by mm -hmm. third party. Yeah. yeah. And will you talk about how that's contrasted against how a lot of the other products are built in the marketplace today? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I think. Generally. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like a lot of they, they are models I think would be the one contrast where you, you have to buy the insights and the data platform and the device in the basement, it's all together. Like you can't mm -hmm. just buy the device and send data to your own cloud. Now that's not an option. Like you could buy the whole thing and then only use the device in the basement, but you're going to pay for the data platform, the insights right. and all of that. So right. um, that they are inextricable. And a lot of times it's just the way they were evolved. And, and, and so that's, kind of one kind of contrast. And the other is that if they're using, like they're either just closed, like they have no APIs or their APIs are poorly, or that they're not using standards, which is the most common problem because yeah, not a lot. I mean, there's kind of the brick standard, Haystack, there's some of that, but Otherwise, there's not a ton of his backnet. Like, if they don't at least communicate with some standard protocols, yeah. that's the other way that they become like. What are your thoughts on? So, if I think about like a lot some companies that I've worked with, they've been doing you call them point solution, you call them full stack, whatever you want to call them. They've been around since like the 2000s, right? So they've been around a long time. They've been doing this full stack thing for yeah. a long time, but when like in order to meet the demands of today's market, it almost seems like they would need to break up all the things they're doing into composable, like you guys are talking about here, components with their own individual APIs. Yeah. What, what do you yeah. think about like a legacy tool adopting that approach? I mean, I think it's going to be hard. It also depends on how they make their revenue. Because I feel like a lot of these, like, some of the legacy ones, it's like they, you know, they either make all their money off hardware, and then like SaaS is like this extra revenue that they're hoping to get, so they really want yeah. to sell you that. And then, but they since they control the hardware in the building, they're not going to make it easy for anybody else because they want to sell you that software even at some par. Or the reverse, you're like a uh, company that you're you make. I think a lot of the sensor companies fall into this category. It's like the hardware business is hard. It's like the margins are crap. The margins are good on software. So like they're making yeah. the hardware, but they make the money off the software. So they're not going to sell you the hardware to just use on your own. You have to right. buy the hardware and the software together. Yeah. Like that. Yeah. It, it, it's hard to do in a way that I think the, if you started your business making money one particular way to like break it apart. Um, Cause you're usually like one thing's funding the other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. I don't know. It's a, uh, it's also just, like, I think the legacy systems, it's, if they weren't built open 15 years ago and it's still in the basement, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> what are you, you going to do about it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it is kind of one of like one of the questions of this era of the smart buildings industry is like, how do, yeah. you know, these older architectures evolve now that different op options exist at each layer of the stack that we just talked about? It's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I'm also interested to see what happens with like these acquisitions where like when like MRI bought Angus, right? Like, yeah. so uh, RXR is Angus and Yardi. Oh, and yeah. so they're like, oh, nuts. Like is, I don't know if MRI is gonna like really think the value is all this is on one platform. So we're gonna mm -hmm. merge Angus into MRI and it's all gonna be one thing. and eventually not support the, the yeah. Yardi or are they going to keep them as two standalone products completely independent? Like I, I could yeah. see from perspective not wanting to enable the competitors, right? Like, yeah. Uh, so lock it down, but then yeah, it just leads towards like this kind of balkanization of the, the industry where you have those couple big stacks. Fascinating. I did want to circle back on something you mentioned. So I just released for our, our pro members, a like a KPIs database. And so our, our pro members are from all types of different technology companies, 
building owners, like basically the whole industry is represented in some way. Yeah. And so I said, basically, well, you know, what, what databases can I start to develop that can help them all do their jobs? And so one of the, one of the ones is like, we, we just released this KPIs database. And one of the things I was struggling with was how does someone measure and report on occupant experience? Right. And so I, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on this, given the tools that you've built, like what KPIs can someone use to say the experience has improved here or the experience is not so good here? What do you think? Yeah. Uh, uh, I think it's a, I mean, it's a really interesting and tough problem, particularly since, but it's valuable. Like so many companies are spending on experience. I saw something in, I think it was the wall street journal that said like, it was like the average landlord spending like two to $3 on like experience spend, like amenities and like that for like uh-huh. per foot, which is huge, yeah, it's a lot. huge. Mm-hmm. particularly if you can't measure the efficacy. And most of the time, like the measurements I've seen are app engagement. It's like, oh, we launched an app, experience app and we have yeah. you know, 60% adoption, but mm-hmm. it's kind of a, like the point of experience isn't to have people use the app. So <laughs> right. uh, yeah, I, what we've been you know, experimenting with is the, I mean, the computer vision stuff has been useful for things like wait times. Like we spent money on a new visitor system to reduce wait time, measuring wait time valuable same with the elevators the wait time like we have the destination dispatch like mm-hmm. is that actually decreasing and, and improving that experience yeah uh, and then we are doing like one of the things we built into the works well platform was uh, basically pulse surveys like in most like consumer companies and, and product companies use nps scores yeah you know, you know the net promoter score so the, the question is Essentially, would you recommend, you know, this product to a friend? And if you would recommend it to a friend. It's probably must, a good experience. Yeah, mm-hmm. you must like it, right? So we developed a variation on that for the for the buildings. Because you can't just be like, would you recommend this office to a friend? Who's like, nah, I got to come here anyways. Like, that's not a valuable, like, <laughs> not applicable. So we were using the question or the exact wording, but essentially like, did the experience of the office impact your decision to come in today? Because that's mm. like, you could stay home. Like now it's choice, right? Like you could stay home or you come to the office. Yeah. Did the office experience impact it? And we are kind of just pushing that out periodically in the way you would an MPS score. So we kind of have this continuing mm-hmm. pulse of our, the last time we did it, our, our building MPS was around like 20, which is good. Like it's a negative 100 to 100. So like 20 yeah. is on the positive side. And but we have that pulse and then we can, as we do things, we're like, oh, we're going to start hosting coffee tastings in the lobby. Mm-hmm. We have that as the benchmark to know if, if our activations are going up. Got the, it. Like this building NPS score is, I think, one way it's, it's to, to get it on an ongoing basis. It's not real time, but it provides that metric. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the other stuff totally blank and what else we have from an experience standpoint. Oh, the other is that we're pulling in, we're doing some sentiment analysis on work orders, obviously tagging and pulling out work orders specific to experience things like hold and as well. And then looking at the like environmental metrics that, that drive experience. So there's humidity, the temperature, CO2 to some extent, but mostly temperature lux noise pressure and the things that basically like make the office suck if it's like too bright and shining too noisy so constantly measuring those and making sure they're within band yeah but it's i'd love to say we crack the nut like we're trying to focus on that we've gotten more the from a building level it's a little harder we are you can watch the occupancy of like amenities and know whether you're amenity is successful and how often it's used. So looking at even just like dwell time in those to know it's like, yeah, people use the cafe, but nobody actually spends any time there. It's maybe wasted too much space on it. Like you could have just had a coffee machine or a barista in a whole like cafe. So looking at dwell time and amenities. And then within the tenant space, when we, we did a lot of pilots where we're deploying like space level occupancy sensors. And that gives us more metrics 
around kind of experience. Like we're looking at like how often there are, there's basically more than one person in, in common areas and are within uh, six feet of each other. Again, this is okay. we kind of built it for COVID for social distancing, but then we did the reverse and basically used it for collaboration. So yeah. like how often is collaboration happening outside of meetings right. as a gauge of like the value and experience of the, the office? Like the, here we have coming to the office now to, to meet people and collaborate. Mm -hmm. If I'm just gonna spend eight hours in a spreadsheet, I can do that at home. So like to measure occupant experience, looking at like the level of collaboration, how often are people together? What is the average like interaction time mm -hmm. like outside of meeting rooms, within meeting rooms, kind of the same, but looking at those separately. Yeah, and then usage of like things like the sofas and kind of the, things that you've invested in from a yeah. experience standpoint. It's hard because it's also, you don't want to really try to keep it as privacy centric as possible. So right. uh, no identifiable information, things like that. So it, it's hard to get at without. Mm -hmm. It's also hard because you just named like 25 different things. And so it's like, yeah. how do I get that into the, the challenge I'm assuming is how do I get that into one or two metrics that help me understand over time yeah. how this yeah. is going? Yeah, like we have developed a couple high level aggregate metrics, like one for health, one for safety, one for like essentially like productivity in terms of like how effective the space is for productivity. We are starting to try and work on one for like a building experience okay. level because it yeah, if your wait times have gone to crap or your even just occupancy has dropped below what is a typical norm, that may be an indicator, you know, yeah. and work orders and stuff, but it is a lot of stuff. So we're trying to figure out how to do some scoring and have like a high level KPI because it's otherwise it's like 20 or 30 metrics and you're kind of, <laughs> yeah, track them off. Yeah. Totally. Oh, well, thank you for that. I mean, that was kind of how I was thinking about it. I'm like, here's the data we could possibly get. And here's the things that it could indicate, but it's pretty complicated, it seems like. So yeah. thanks for validating that. Well, let's end off with some some carve outs. I'd love to hear what what book, movie, TV show, podcast, or others you would, you would recommend the audience checks out. Sure. I've been listening to one called Ologies. I don't know if you're familiar okay. with it. Like it's a podcast. Uh, you know, because I... And I was listening to the, of course, like the times, like the daily, but then I don't know, there's certain times where like COVID gets you down after a while and you're like, I just can't hear another one or the uh -huh. Ukraine war. You're like, I want to know what's going on, but I don't need 30 minutes every day. So the ology okay. is more escapism. So it's, uh, it's one woman that just interviews different ologists, people that study stuff, but like super obscure. Like the, the one that got me hooked was a friend of mine who was telling me about the one on hagfish ology. So it's a guy that just studies hagfish, which are these like weird, like basically like prehistoric like worms that can produce a ridiculous amount of slime in a couple of seconds. Like that is their pure defense mechanism. <laughs> they just produce so much slime that they cannot be bitten or they'll produce the slime that fills the fish's gills and everything and they spit them out. Oh my God. Uh, but then they have like one on like there was one on bovine neuropathy, which is basically a study of like animal head biting. Like it's this really niche ologies, but super fascinating because it's like one person that's been looking at this for 20 years and just that <laughs> that focus, but also just the the oddities of like yeah that come out of it. So yeah, it, it's good like infotainment, like education yeah. So yeah. Okay. Love that. Have to, we'll put that in the show notes for people that want a distraction. It sounds yeah. like. So mine is this book called Imaginable, and the author's Jane McGonigal. I just started listening to it. I heard her on the Tim Ferriss podcast, which I have listened to for a really long time. So she is a a game designer and futurist, and I'll just leave this for people as a teaser. She did a game simulation in 2008 on what people would do if an um, airborne pandemic came in 2020. And so they gamed it out and they surveyed people and like, how would you react? Would you go to school? Would you go to the office? What, if people put mask mandates, would you wear them? They had questions like, like real questions like this. 
in 2008. And same thing with the sort of fake news misinformation. They had a simulation around that in 2010. And again, it was, if this happens in 2020, how will you react? It was like, it's extremely, extremely, extremely fascinating. So I guess we'll put We'll put this interview in the show notes with Tim Ferriss, but also the book's called Imaginable. I just couldn't help myself. I had to know how she did that. And was it, it yeah, was it's, it, it's really fascinating. Was it accurate? Like, did it predict? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so when the pandemic first came, you know, January, 2020, she was getting phone calls from people like CEOs, policymakers, like, Hey, I heard you did this study 10 years ago. What should we do? And the stuff she was telling them to do is like, you should know that people are not going to stop going to weddings and people are not going to stop going to church and people are not like, you have to shut those things down immediately or else you can't leave it up to choice because that's where we get our, you know, sense of community, our sense of self from is these events. And so a lot of like the early, like we have to shut this down laws I I think at least some of them came from people consulting her and saying, what should we do based on your, your game that you made 10 years ago? Really, really, really fascinating. So I'll leave people with that. (laughs) I'm not done with the book yet, but I I definitely recommend the book. I'm like 20% of the way through it. So anyway, Corey, it's great to come on the show and great to pick your brain a little bit. So thank you. Thanks. All right, friends, thanks for listening to this episode of the Nexus Podcast. For more episodes like this and to get the weekly Nexus newsletter, which, by the way, readers have said is the best way to stay up to date on the future of the smart building industry, please subscribe at nexuslabs.online. You can find the show notes for this conversation there as well. Have a great day.